Near Futurist, a podcast with Guy Clapperton. Hello, and thanks for downloading The Near Futurist, a show presented by me, Guy Clapperton. Many schools are back in business this week, at least in the UK, as we start to emerge from lockdown. But things can't just continue as they were. It's an area I'd explored before in this program, and we're returning to it again. Now, at this point, I normally stop and do a quick bio of myself and hint ever so subtly that if you have a conference coming up, I can be available as MC or speaker, but nobody's planning conferences at the moment. So I'll just say if you need to do face-to-face press interviews or want help with online presentation skills, you can find me at remotemediatraining.com. I've been a technology journalist for over 30 years and I know the traps, and I've been training remotely for over 10 years. But you didn't come to the podcast to hear me talk about myself. You came to hear what my guest has to say. He's an expert in education and associated technologies. He has experience working on ed tech in the UK, that's education technology in the UK, EMEA, Europe, Middle East and Africa, and Asia. And before joining his current company, he was the founding chief operating officer at EtonX, a company teaching soft skills online. And before that, he was CEO, chief executive officer of Maths Doctor, an online tutoring company. Currently, he's the UK country manager of Quizlet, and his name is Rahim Herji. Rahim, welcome. Thanks for having me, Guy. Thank you for coming. Now, as always, I've cribbed what I could find out about you from many other sources and uh, just cut and pasted remorselessly, totally shamelessly. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about yourself and, of course, about Quizlet itself. I've spent much of my career in technology. I started in banking. I didn't quite like that space. Uh, and moved towards media and then towards education and education technology. So um, I used to work for a publisher called HarperCollins, and that saw the advent of digital transformation into ebooks. And that's where I got a taste for education with Collins Learning. And there we invested in, in education in, and looked at uh, ed tech. From there, I moved into an online tutoring business, Math Doctor, as you mentioned, where we delivered online maths tuition to students in the UK and pre, uh, just just after that I uh, co-founded a business that turned into EtonX uh, which delivered soft skills training into Chinese students uh, in, in, uh, in China and then into a global platform uh, around the world. I joined Quizlet in uh, at the tail end of last year to help in spearheading some of the international growth but also looking at the UK market. What exactly is Quizlet? What's it do? Quizlet is a, it's a global learning platform that provides engaging study tools to help students practice and master whatever they're learning. So it could be from any age, really. And at its heart, it's a very good at flashcards, and that's how it was established. But there are practice questions, interactive diagrams, and games. So you could actually use it for anything. So my daughter uses it to learn French, uh, Latin, and German vocab. But you could quite easily use it for GCC geography or SATs in the US or if you were learning, learning English in, in Asia, for example. I'd like to uh, take a broader look at this whole area than just looking at Quizlet. And I know you've been in the area for some time. Sure. I normally keep questions purely professional, but I am aware because uh, your associates told me with your permission, I hope, uh, that you've done the home tutoring thing with your own family. I assume that's your daughter you were just talking about. <laughs> Tell me a bit about how that's gone. Without um, don't you know? Don't, don't burst <laughs> into tears. Don't have a breakdown. Just you know, just think of me as you know. There's nobody listening. How's it gone? The uh, first thing I should say is it's very much a joint effort between myself and my wife. Uh, we're both in a kind of online education space, and to be brutally honest, it's pretty tough. You know, two parents at home doing their day jobs um, and in, a, in a quite intense environment, um, and then having to shepherd our two daughters to to help them kind of reach learning goals on a daily and weekly basis i don't want to pry but could you give me a rough age group for them sure my 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 eldest is 13 and my youngest is eight so we're past that early early age bracket i think so i think if you've got kids who are probably below the age of eight it's very difficult my eldest is is pretty self-sufficient and and follows um, what she's been told um, at at school, and and teachers have been directing her and what what to do on a on a, almost on an hourly by hour by hour basis. And the youngest is trying to do the same thing, but uh, needs a little bit more shepherding through. So uh, you were just telling me how it's gone and how they're responding. 
The eldest has, has been pretty diligent, sitting down um, every every morning at nine a.m. and they they have occasional classes, live classes, where they uh, turn up to their with their with their tutors. Um, and she finishes her work, and, and actually she she's complaining a little bit that, that she's had a bit too much work because I think that some of the teachers think that um, because there's no commute into school and commute out of school that they've got a little bit more time. So she's been uh, a little bit stressed about that. Um, the youngest, I think, in the first couple of weeks of lockdown, which was whilst we kind of knew it was going to happen, it was a little bit of a shock for, I think, the whole education establishment that suddenly schools have stopped the tail end of the Easter term. Um, and so that period was particularly difficult because I don't think there was an enough work given. So um, my daughter would finish um, her allocated tasks by midday and then we've got to try and keep her occupied for the, for the rest of the time. But I think this summer term has been really, re- you know, really well planned out. There's a good mix of uh, educational work and some fun activities. Some of the schools are, are, are you know, asking students to provide evidence of physical education. So they're doing lots of dancing in front of, in front of the laptops and things like that. Right. Uh, I'm sure you don't join in with lots and lots of dad dancing, but please don't share the video with me. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, can put it on YouTube by all means, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give that one a swerve. Yeah. Um, well, I should just place this uh, in context as people do listen to these shows sometime after they've been recorded as well as during the week of uh, release. We're recording on uh, June the 1st when uh, a lot of schools are actually going back and uh, a lot of families also are being reported to have kept their kids back from school. Without uh, commenting on um, your family's specific circumstances, I seriously don't want to pry. Do you think uh, this is the right time to be sending kids back to school? Well, it's a, well, it's a very topical and a very difficult question. The question remains, one, is it safe? That's a big question. But on the other side, there's this, there's this quandary about kids and their, you know, their personal growth, their educational growth. There's a divide between those that work, in, work well within a school context and those who, who, who are not particularly, can't, ne- can't necessarily work as well in, um, at home. Um, so there's, 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 there's that balance that we've, we've kind of got to, got to meet up with. Um, my personal view is that an easing back would be good and I think it probably needed to be one one year group at a time um, to kind of try and see how things are working um, it's very difficult to social distance I mean especially with you know, the the primary school kids that are, are are going back you know those reception in year one um, how are they going to social distance you know they all want to hug each other and and play closely to each other so so we'll have to see I mean I, I think um, the government's going to have to you know, monitor the R level as, as they have been doing and, and we'll have to see what happens. But um, my, view, my view is I think it's probably time and it, it probably in a slower way than we, we have at the moment. Back to the homeschooling. I know that you've been heavily involved with your own technology, with your own companies, of course, but taking a step back, could you give me an overview of what you think has worked and what hasn't in your own experience of uh, homeschooling and pieces of technology? I think what's, what's changed actually in, in the last three to five years is this I'm not sure what the phrase is, but the big techification of, of education. And I think what's happened and what's escalated over the last, uh, I guess, three months is probably three years worth of adoption. So things like Google Classroom and Microsoft Teams, which were, you know, obviously growing in, in the UK ed tech space, have started to you know, make stakes in the ground, not just in the UK, but around the world. So I think what's happening is that there are, are a number of different products that come out of there and teachers are using them based on, based on the curricula, some of which are good and some of which are not so good. And I think that's the quandary that we're in at the moment. Okay, their children's minds are a lot more absorbent uh, than those of adults. They're very receptive to ideas. They learn really quickly, uh, whereas we're much more set in our ways. How does that accept the sort of app and technology that they're likely to respond to in your experience? Well, I, th- I think what's happening is uh, because, you know, because of this kind of fast adoption, I think you'll see that the younger kids will find their new normal. So this kind of blended education, which people have been talking around, talking about for a long time now, is starting to come to fruition. And I think what's going to happen is that the younger kids will feel that it's normal and the ad- adults will find this a little bit difficult. That's not to say that it's not, in- you know, not insurmountable. I think what will happen is that um, adults will have to move to this this new kind of um, mode of you know live online you know some some offline and then some kind of self directed you know online courses and those things will all you know all exist in the education space whether you want to pay for them 
or you get it um, directed. So I think what's going to happen is the younger kids in summation are going, are going to adopt this really quickly. And I think the adults will, will have to move towards it over the next uh, two to three years. I've said this before on the podcast, but I, a few years ago, I visited my daughter's school when she was still at school and they had this uh, electronic whiteboard. And that was a revelation to me because, you know, it just shows you how long ago I was in school with, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> apps and things. It's just uh, sort of brand new. But uh, I, seriously, I do know a few teachers and educationists and even psychologists. I'm just wondering who a company like Quizlet talks to before putting an app together or in the process of putting an app together, because it's fairly clear from me from your background that as you described it that you're a technologist rather than an educationalist and feel free to correct me if i'm wrong I, i'm probably technologist first than than, than education that's correct yeah okay but, so uh, who else did you get into in, does uh, a company like quizlet have to talk to uh, to put a competent app together i'd probably take you back to the original story of quizlet because quizlet was invented by a student at secondary school when when he was struggling to learn French vocabulary, so created this, you know, very, this very, very, the very crux of what, what Quizlet is today um, to help them do that. And, and I think what's happened is it's, it's, it's grown since then. So we're looking at kind of user needs um, and figuring out what students enjoy doing. It. And we're, you know, we're looking at the data behind how students master specific material. Um, and, and you can look at the data, but we, we all the time we're, we're speaking to teachers, parents and students to understand you know, what works for them, what doesn't work for them, obviously looking at the market. But really, you know, it's, it's really if you're looking about what we're trying to get done, we're trying to help students learn in the easiest way possible. So to, to speak to them and understand their data and understand how they're learning is really how, how we come about to um, developing Quizlet further. Okay, so let's say I'm um, a teacher looking to implement, or indeed maybe I'm a student uh, looking to use Quizlet. Talk me through how it works and uh, indeed how it's going to be sustainable as we start to move back into the classroom environment. So Quizlet, it's, um, it's, an, it's an online revision platform that is you know, freely accessible by the web or mobile app, so on iOS and Android. And you know, it's, it's rooted in the ability to revise outside of the classroom, as well as within. So we've got a product that, that can be used within the classroom. So I think anyone who, um, you know, a student who's self-directed or a teacher who's directing during, during remote, these remote times can either, a teacher can set and create a set of terms to, to learn, um, vocab or whatever, whatever it may be, and direct that specifically at a student. A student could come to the platform, see the you know, 400 million sets that we've got available, search for what they're looking for and, and use that themselves. But I think you know, your, the second part of your question is, is how, how that's gonna change as we come back into some sort of normality in, in, in school. And I think we've had a, you know, a large number of teachers sign up and students sign up in this, in this period. And I think what's gonna happen is there's gonna be this, this kind of new wave whereby there'll be more usage within the classroom and more usage um, in revision and at home. Do you see that wave uh, subsiding as people go back uh, uh, to school or are you putting marketing bushes uh, in place in order to sustain it? I think in a, with a product like Quizlet, because we are content, content agnostic and we support everything that the teacher is doing, I think we'll, we will continue to see uh, usage. And, and actually what we're trying to do is curate the best sets for them, support them in, in what they're trying to do. So we, we continue to see, I think, and we will continue to see growth as we go back to school. Okay, does it fit in with other educational technologies? I'm just thinking of all these things. So, you know, the old uh, approach of siloed technology seems to be on the way out. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I think, well, I think the first thing to say is uh, Quizlet's a, a supplemental tool. So it's a supplemental learning tool, so you can use it by yourself. So you don't need to integrate with any other platform. You can just say, I want to learn French vocab for my holiday. I want to learn German vocab for my GCSE. So you can go and do that by itself. But the, the, the flip side of that, we, you know, I touched on Google Classroom and Microsoft Teams and you know, some of these other learning management systems. We integrate with those educational technologies also. So it becomes very easy for a teacher to get a student to, to learn through Quizlet. Do you see the, um, uh, the overall uh, electronic classroom, the, the, the AI in the classroom increasing over the years? Or do you think there's uh, still plenty of room for human teacher interaction? I mean, personally, I think um, teachers are, are critical to the, uh, the educational process, and I don't think teachers are going to go away. 
but I do think that um, their role may slightly change and they'll be supported by newer technologies. And you know, lo lots of companies talk about AI, um, AI in education and AI in the classroom. But really, we haven't, we haven't quite seen that just yet. And, and actually, you need such a large data set to be able to get you know, actual AI within, within education and within, within any, any kind of a sphere that um, I think we're kind of moving towards that. So, you know, one of the things that, that you know, we've, we've got is, is, you know, we have a, a billion questions answered every week on our platform. So that's a, you know, that's a lot of data to help in, in, in that learning process. And we're going to use that to help and support teachers and their teacher directed learning, but also to help students directly in, in, you know, signposting how and how's the best way to learn. And all the way through, I didn't use the uh, phrase ne new normal once. I managed that. I'm quite proud of that. So I think final... I did. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well that possibly. That, that's okay. Uh, so um, final question, really. Uh, where can listeners find out more about yourself and your organization? I urge uh, listeners to go to quizlet.com, um, uh, where you can, you can freely uh, see all the relevant sets. You can go to the iOS store and the Android store to, to download the apps. If, they, if anyone wants to connect with me, feel free to on, on LinkedIn, Raheem Herji, and uh, look forward to connecting. Okay, Raheem Herji on Quizlet, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Guy. And many thanks to you for listening. That was the Near Futurist podcast with me, Guy Clapperton. Don't forget to have a look at the website at nearfuturist.co.uk or my media training site at remotemediatraining.com. I'll be back in two weeks' time. Stay safe. Thank you.